So let's continue on. I've got I've only got 13% battery, but it's on my brand new battery, so it's going to last for a long time. I'm up at the snow resort right now. I just got a cup of coffee. The woman in the snow resort was pretty nice to me. She wouldn't let me go without helping me to fix my boot. Like I'm wearing my old Magnum high tech boots, and the glue, the shoe glues, come undone. So I tripped, and one of them was like. Um, I didn't trip, like I just, my, my foot hit the thing at the bar as I was getting coffee and um, she thought it was her fault like that I tripped and I was like, no, nah, no, nah, look at my shoe, it's totally wrecked, I need to throw out my shoe. And then she went on a quest to try and find some gaffer tape to help me to fix up my shoe and I, I spent like an extra probably five minutes there talking to her and, and she's looking through her stuff, rummaging everywhere looking for gaffer tape. In the end all she could find was sellotape. And then she insisted that I keep the roll of sellotape and, and that I could I could do up my boots. So I did up my boot. <laughs> it's kind of a funny experience. So I have those kind of experiences now where I kind of people try and help me and I connect with people a little bit better than I used to. And people are nice to me and maybe even attracted to me. Um, which never used to happen in the past. In the past, I was always very closed off, very business-like. Um, <clears throat> I, I get the feeling that people want to be in my life now that have only just met me. It's the strangest thing the strangest thing it's not strange at all it's natural it's totally totally natural but what it is is that I'm now recovering from narcissistic abuse lifelong and that's what's happening so I didn't even expect that like that little story I was just going to get straight back into talking about my narcissistic neighbor across the road that slammed her door every 20 minutes and that would call the council on you and try and get you to um, cut down the privacy grass so that she could see better into your backyard when you're in there. So it's more of a struggle for you to spend time in your backyard because she'd be watching you in your backyard without the privacy screen there because you'd had to chop it down because she'd got you to get the council to get you to shut, chop it down. And all this kind of intricate minutia. So I've now, I've now got some, some uh, cello tape, some plastic tape wrapped around the front of my Magnum boot thanks to this this woman when I stopped at the bar to get a coffee <laughs> like that's really good like that's really really good like that's that's proof positive right there of the um, outcomes that you're starting to get from recovery from codependency you're being yourself you're talking to another human being and you're a human being and you just kind of things fairly Things fairly quickly go from being sort of nervous and um, formal to being sort of like um, everyone's everyone's calm, everyone's happy, everyone's relaxed. Everyone feels in their comfort zone, both you and them. And um, I don't know, really, I don't know. <clears throat> Going down the mountain now. If you get to that point in an interaction with a stranger where they lose their self-consciousness, you know you know that you know that things are going well. Yeah, so like the biggest like discovery and revelation 
to me in my life is this whole deal about evil, discovering evil, discovering narcissism, sociopathy, psycho uh, psychopathy, and by the same token, discovering myself, discovering codependency, discovering childhood complex post-traumatic stress disorder, discovering all of these things, the kind of constellation of traits that you have when you've got CPTSD from from your pre-verbal age, from not being loved by the one that you're raised by, and by the family that you're surrounded by, realizing things like that you, your family never loved you and things like that, at least as far as my mother's side of the family goes. You know what? Um, I spoke to my gra uh, text via text message. I spoke to my grandma yesterday or the day before. I think it was yesterday. And afterwards, I actually shed a tear because I realized that I was loved. Like, it's hard. When, you, when you're when you in the situation where you've been raised by narcissists, you, all this kind of stuff, like, you you end up not really knowing who loves you and who doesn't. And you're very, you become very wary without realizing it. You don't know. And because you've been taught to trust the narcissist only and not yourself you've got this absence of self-trust stuff like that and so in terms of figuring out who loves you and, and who's pretending to love you it's a very difficult thing and you go from that sort of scenario to being able to spot a narcissist fairly quickly sometimes within 24 hours you can spot a narcissist it's pretty difficult to do you can't do it with every single one of them but with a lot of them you can just recognize them by their behavior it's you'll know them by their fruits you you see someone that you've known you've known of them for, for years or you know them and then you just scrutinize them according to the criteria that you've learned that that narcissists have in their personality and you go my god in addition to my my intuition telling me this person's full of spite i can see in all of their status seeking behavior and so on i can see many many traits here of a narcissist it turns out that this person was a narcissist all along and uh there was me thinking that regarding them well and thinking that they were a distinguished and high status member of the community and now i see that they're just like a worm that's masquerading as a nice person they're basically a parasite and one of the one of the big tells often is a lack of substance they appear they're sick of um, uh, they're sophists they have the appearance of substance but they actually don't have much of any substance at all and they don't try and have substance they try and appear to have substance they're, they're keen on having uh, connections to people that are well respected and things like that they, they, they make public donations their charity is in public you know shit like that like just real basic um, political power seeking uh, behaviors and to be honest with you I need to learn from them I need to go oh so that's how it's done so if I want to look good in public if I want to improve my public image that's how it's done it's all mechanical and a demon is a machine I was I was listening to I was, I was, I was reading some comments on videos about uh, sociopathy a lot of it was a Richard Richard Grannon video and a lot of sociopaths would like I think he'd asked them to, to say what their experience of the world was in terms of love so a lot of sociopaths were tuning in and saying I'm a diagnosed sociopath and this is my experience of love and hate and all this kind of stuff love and anger it's very very interesting two of the comments caught my eye one of them I screenshotted they're saying things like I experience anger as rage and I experience love as obsession because the whole question was, can sociopaths love? And all of the sociopaths were chiming in and saying, yeah, yeah, I can love. But if I'm trying to describe to you my experience of the world, it's more like everybody else is experiencing the world on a volume of, say, 30, whereas I'm experiencing the world on a volume of zero, but um, my emotional volume can go to 110 in a split second. Uh, and I don't feel uh, fear, I feel, uh, I, d I go to anger very quickly, and my anger is not really mo like anger, it's better described as rage, and I feel love, but my love is more like obsession, and this strikes a chord with me to the point that I screenshotted it, 
because this one that was obsessed with me I've had a few of them obsessed with me actually I must have something that they want because the, the other thing they say is their love is transactional so they, they, they don't care about what you're getting they only care about getting their needs met so if they're getting their needs met they love you uh, but if they're not then they're not loving you this kind of thing so and what are their needs unfortunately their needs are for sadism so uh, <clears throat> if they're getting their sadistic needs met like they're treating you like shit they love you that, it's bizarre but that's how it is that's their form of love so it's not any as someone put it it's not any kind of love that anyone would want to be subjected to because it, it's basically sadism I love you because because I'm getting sadistic supply out of you. I love you because I'm causing you pain. When I'm causing you pain, I love you. I've likened, I've likened the narcissist or psychopath or sociopath, narcissist um, gaze or stare on a on a codependent or on an empath really as the stare of a wolf on a on a flock of sheep. Have you ever seen a wolf staring like it's a predator stare, looking at a at a prey animal? those big intelligent like binocular eyes predator eyes with pitilessness in them <clears throat> like a shark you know narcissists often compare themselves to a wolf or a shark I personally <clears throat> have seen them compare themselves I've you I've seen them use in their speech patterns references to wolves something like um, better not wake the sleeping wolf one of them said they use references to wolves so yeah I just want to say like you you can feel it when when you're being stared at as a as an empath when you're being that doesn't realize it any of this stuff you, you don't have boundaries because you don't realize you're an empath and so on when you're being kind of stared at metaphorically by a uh, Uh, by like a, a sociopath or a psychopath it's like a wolf staring at a sheep and you can feel it they've got this I've, I've expressed this before they've male or female they've got this kind of romantic interest in you even though you're a guy and it, it's the strangest thing they don't care at all about you but you've got something that they want what have you got that they want you've, you're an empath you can feel feelings and they're all about manipulating a person's feelings and then and then harvesting the, the the negative energy out of the person from manipulating their feelings. Or positive energy as well. They're about manipulating people's feelings to get positive and negative energy. Positive energy you could call narcissistic supply. Negative energy is sadistic supply. But particularly the negative, because they're evil, they prefer negative than positive, uh, the sadistic side of things. So... Yeah, it's the strangest thing. When a male or female narcissist or, or psychopath or sociopath is focusing on you in this wolf-like kind of attention that they're paying to you, it's the weirdest thing. You, you can feel the interest that they have in you. It's, uh, how can I describe it? It's like a hev It's like... It's exactly like if you're a sheep and a wolf is staring at you, but more, more like if a wolf in sheep's clothing is staring at you. You can feel the interest on you. You can feel the interest on you, and it transcends male and female, because both male and female sociopaths, psychopaths, let's just call them, have subjected me to this kind of predator stare over, over months and years, when they're, they're, they're thinking, ooh, that, one, that one's got something that I want. That one's got something that I want. It's the strangest thing. And it manifests itself as a desire to kind of uh, uh, relate to you in a romantic way, whether they're male or female. And remember, they're all, they're all, um, they're all bisexual. So like the males and the, the males will still approach a male romantically because so psychopaths are bisexual this is not hearsay like there's so much evidence that shows this it's just a these days I take it as a accepted fact 
It's not like, oh yeah, some of them are, some of them aren't. No, they're they're all like that. And um, yeah, like like this this one female psychopath, basically. You know, having such a bad object, I was like, wow, she seems interested in me, but she doesn't want to talk to me, but she seems interested in me. It's the weirdest thing. And because I had such bad objects, such negative self-talk, such negative view of myself, such negative inner critic, I was like, well, how could she possibly like me? Like, I'm nothing sort of thing. But no, she had some like of me. She had some interest in me. She was obsessed with me. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. It was very interesting to me. I screenshotted these comments. Richard Grannon's video... He'd asked sociopaths, uh, do you feel love? And they're all chiming in there and saying, yeah, yeah, I feel love, but it's more like obsession. And this broad was totally <coughs> obsessed, totally obsessed, obsessed with me, totally obsessed with me, and yet didn't care for me at all. <coughs> it was the weirdest thing. Didn't want to be publicly associated with me at all. Didn't care about me but was obsessed with me. It was the weirdest thing. And so this was a mystery that I had to solve and I solved it. She even one time accused me of being a psychopath. She said, you're a racist psychopath. Don't forget that they project. Everything that they say about you is a projection. I was also thinking about Hitler's final words to the German, or about the German people <clears throat> was like a devalue discard, <coughs> basically. He basically said, if the German people aren't good enough to win the World War II, then they don't even deserve to exist. And that's such a harsh, I mean, there's kind of some logic to it, but that's such a harsh and terrible and horrible thing to say because they had dutifully and loyally followed Hitler, his every order they followed. And then after following his orders for six years of world war and for all the years prior to that during civilian times they what what thanks did hitler give them he didn't really say you fought very well congratulations all of his all of his generals said that he just said you know what if the german people aren't good enough to win this war then they don't even deserve to exist i mean talk of, so if hitler was a psychopath or a, or a sociopath one thing that sociopaths do is they do a thing called the discard. They suck all the energy out of you and then they discard you. Which is attempting to separate, individuate from the mother, according to um, Sam Vaknin and others. Which they never can. They're constantly trying to separate from the mother. They say that you are the mother. In this case, you could argue that Hitler was calling the German people the mother. He's trying to individuate from the mother which he never can because he's, he's permanently enmeshed with them, metaphorically. So, so part of individuating from the mother is to devalue and discard the mother figure. In this case, it's you or me or someone that they're trying to devalue and discard. You could argue that Hitler was devalue discarding the German people the, way, the same way a psychopath tries to individuate in vain by devaluing and discarding another person, in this case Hitler devaluing, discarding the German people. The German people lost the war and they don't deserve to exist because they, they couldn't win the war. That's kind of what he was saying at the end of the war, his last words. It's a pretty horrible thing to say. These people had dutifully followed his orders and then he just goes, you know what, you don't even deserve to exist. I'm just trying to point out to you that, look, I know so many people like Hitler I've started re reviewing and assessing everybody now that I know of for um, the traits of, of psychopathy since I know it so well from my personal life. <clears throat> and I've got to say there's a lot of overlap there in Hitler with the psychopathy. I mean, most people say, oh yeah, Hitler was a psychopath. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But mostly that's a two it's a one-dimensional thing because they've watched hollywood movies and it's just basically like hitler and the jews hitler therefore a psychopath but i'm not even talking about that because a lot of that is baloney what i'm talking about is like look at the traits of hitler look at how he treated geli rabul his niece who was romantically infatuated with him and was his girlfriend look at how he treated geli rabul he treated her so badly that she took his 
pistol and shot herself through the heart. Think about the symbology of that. She didn't shoot herself in the head. She shot herself through the heart and she died. Hitler didn't treat the women around him that very well. He certainly didn't have any kind of sexual interest in them. He was basically like a, a, a cerebral schizoid psychopath. Which means basically celibate and asexual, not interested in sex. And you might say, well, but he, he had a woman there that he stayed with for a long time, uh, Eva, Eva Braun, Eva Braun. Yeah, but Eva Braun had her own issues which matched perfectly with Hitler. So he, apparently, according to, the, to the, the, the way the history goes, he met Eva Braun, who was a shop girl at, uh, at, at Hoffman's photography uh, shop in like Munich or Berlin or somewhere. Uh, was it Heinrich Hoffman? Hoffman, somebody Hoffman. <coughs> so, or Helmut or something. So Hoffman was, was like Hitler's personal photographer. And he, I think he just walked into Hoffman's shop one day and they struck up a, a, an association, a business association, and maybe a friendship. Gelly, sorry, not Gelly Rubble, uh, Ava, Ava Braun, she worked as a shop girl, <coughs> a shop assistant, excuse me, in Hoffman's photography shop. It was like, you know, petite bourgeois, high street kind of photography shop sort of thing, you know? Sort of like the mod, the olden days equivalent of like an Apple Apple store or something, although it's not a corporation store, it's, a, it's an individual. But, you know, he'd be selling his cameras and his Agfa color film and all sorts of shit there, you know, little, little um, home movie cameras and stuff. A nice little shop. So Hitler basically married eventually. Well, he got together. She was his girlfriend with Eva Braun. Eva Braun. The thing I'm trying to say to you about this relationship is that it perfectly matched the schizoid. Eva Braun, the evidence really does suggest that she had gynecological peculiarities. Uh, Hitler had paid for a number of procedures at a gynecologist, I think in Berlin, for, for her, for Eva Braun. She went to a gynecologist for a number of procedures. And the problem that she had, apparently one in 6,000, one in 5,000 females are born with this problem. And it literally basically is or translates to like a, like a small vagina. <clears throat> and women that have this small vagina problem, they're not very interested in sex because it's painful because their opening is too small. Sex is painful for them, so what interest do they have in it? Not much. Can they give birth? I don't know. I don't know. It might be catastrophic for them to give birth because of the small canal. But something is like painful sex, not really likely to give birth. This condition of small vagina that Ava Braun largely is known to have had based on the... the um, like the payment receipts to this known gynecologist in like Berlin or somewhere that Hitler had paid money to on a couple of occasions on behalf of Eva Braun for procedures. She'd had procedures there at the gynecologist, like operations, like, like gen general, anest general anesthetic operations. <clears throat> so if you're a schizoid cerebral psychopath like Hitler, what you need is you need a beard in a sense, in, in effect. You need a beard to cover up your schizoid disinterest in sex and in females. So what do you do? You get a woman that kind of fits your needs well. And who's that? That's Ava Braun. Why? Because, well, first of all, you trust her because she works for Hoffman and you know and like Hoffman, your photographer. Oh, it's, it's Hoffman. Oh, it's Ava Braun. Oh, it's, it's, it's bourgeois Munich beer hall happy, happy. <coughs> It's not like you met her on Tinder or some shit. <laughs> Can't trust those Tinder broads, eh? So, <laughs> did Hitler meet Ava Braun on Tinder? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you know, you trust her from that connection, familiarity, but also it's like, um, he needs a woman that's not really gonna want sex and she's not going to want sex because she has pain when she has sex. She has small vagina that she's born with. 
So that explains better than anything why the two of them had a peculiar sex life that didn't seem very animated. Hitler, schizoid, cere uh, cerebral psychopath, schizoid, celibate, uh, disinterested in sex, can have it, but just doesn't want it, uninterested in sex. The cerebral focuses all of their real, all of their energy, their psyche, all of their energy goes into their brain, goes into their brain. It doesn't go into the, the body. They're not of the body, they're of the brain. So, you know, a lot of schizoids are not really sure whether they're male or female. They're kind of like, I'm just a robot, I'm not a human. And um, same with psychopaths and narcissists. So you've got a, a schizoid psychopath like Hitler. His, his gender identity is really not very male. And then... And if you're wondering what I'm talking about there, if you feel that I've lost you, let me, let me set you straight. Go and look at... Uh, I kind of consider him a, a friend. Uh, go, and, go and look at Sandman's logo... Sandman admits that he's a schizoid. There's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm just saying that, um, I mean, Sandman does MGTOW videos, which is men going their own way, which is sort of like the opposite of feminism, I suppose. Or it's a response to feminism, basically. It's being wary of females because of all the damage they can do to your life if you get married to them or cohabitate with them or if you have kids with them. They can drag you through divorce courts. They can divorce rape you got valid points they can false accuse you of rape and just put you in the slammer for not something you didn't do all sorts of bad stories out there i get it you know women have horror stories too it's 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 just it's just horrible chaos out there for both sexes but i'm just saying like sandman says that he's a schizoid and you can tell that he has a robotic countenance he speaks like a robot but he doesn't have relationships with women even though he says he's good looking you don't know what he looks like but He's able, he's able to get chicks. He's able to pull chicks. Chicks are interested in him, but he chooses not to have any relationships. So he's the perfect guy to be doing men going their own way videos because he himself inherently is not interested in women. So what better, what better guy to be doing men going their own way videos that's not a homosexual that likes women but is not interested in having relationships or sex with them than a schizoid? A schizoid is much better than a homosexual for this role. Schizoid is asexual, not interested in sex, not interested in women, not interested in relationships, just totally interested in being by themselves, like Hitler. Hitler was a schizoid, I'm sure of it. So go and look at, if, if you think I've lost you, no, no, I can get you back on track. Go and look at Sandman's logo, particularly his new logo. I don't think it's the one that he uses on his YouTube channel. I think if... If you, look, if you look at Sandman's Odyssey channel, and if you look at his uh, Rumble channel, probably on his Odyssey channel, you'll see his new logo. And it's like a cartoon version of his, of his pre-existing logo. His logo is like, think of Uncle Sam. You know, Uncle Sam pointing the finger at you with the top hat and the Star Spangled Banner kind of stuff. And the Uncle Sam. Think of Uncle Sam, but with photoshopped Marilyn Monroe's face onto Uncle Sam. That's Sandman's logo. That's a, that's a hybrid between a male and a female, isn't it? That's Sandman's logo. The original logo doesn't look very strange, but the, the updated version of it in recent months or years does look quite strange. It's way too feminine, and that's why I'm saying it to you. If you look like look at Sandman's Odyssey channel, I think it is, and he's got his his updated logo. It's the it's the Uncle Sam Marilyn Monroe logo, but it's cartoon format. It's a cartoon that some Fiverr artist has drawn, and the the face of Marilyn Monroe just looks so feminine and, and you know an attractive female. It's Marilyn Monroe, and you just like that's his logo that he's putting forth of himself. It kind of looks like he's a girl, basically. So. This is an insight for you into the, the dilemma, the world, the, the self-view of a schizoid. They don't really see themselves as a man if they're a man. They see themselves as like without a sex in the same way that a robot like R2-D2 would be without a sex. Do you get what I'm saying? It's funny. As I was figuring out uh, that this broad was autistic... I hadn't figured out that she was narcissistic yet. I'd actually asked Sandman 
to do a video and analyzing her and why she was behaving so strangely to me. And I donated to him uh, handsomely. I said, look, man, just do the best you can to, to figure this out. I just really want to know what the hell's going on here. Genuinely, I just want to know what's going on. So he gave a, gr a great good analysis and he concluded that she was envious of me. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I didn't see that coming, but it's a piece of the puzzle. I still didn't know that she was a narcissist. What a narcissist? They're envious, right? So he was spot on with that. So um, the funny thing is, I think Sandman didn't know whether to trust me or not, whether I was setting him up or not, because, which I wasn't, because like the assignment that I'd given him was controversial. And the thing is, what, what later transpired, like very, very soon it dawned on me, just after I'd asked him to do this, two things dawned on me basically simultaneously. I realized that, that this broad, not only was she autistic, but that she was schizoid, just like Hitler. Uh, Hitler was a schizoid. I realized that she was a schizoid. Like I, I asked Sandman, please do an analysis of this this chick and tell, tell me what her weird, her, her behavior is so inexplicable towards me. Please tell me what you think is going on there. Give me your best analysis. As soon as I'd asked him that, I realized that she was not only autistic, but she was a schizoid. And no sooner had I realized that she was a schizoid, judging by the, I just researched and I just comprehended the, the traits of schizoid, I then realized, oh my God, isn't Sandman saying that he's a schizoid? Oh no. So I, I thought that he might think that I was like trying to trying to set him up or something because I was effectively I was asking a schizoid to analyze a schizoid. <laughs> so it's kind of like she's I have objection to her behavior. It's dawning on me now that she's a schizoid. He's a schizoid. I'm asking a schizoid to review the behavior, the objectionable behavior of a schizoid. He might have been thinking, uh, is he trying to expose me for being a schizoid? Is he trying to make fun of me for being a schizoid? Which I wasn't. But, it, you know, it's just a funny timing that I managed to figure out that she was a schizoid. And at the same time, I was, it was dawning on me, oh, shit, Sandman's also a schizoid. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know? So, anyway, schizoids have this kind of identity that's not really having a gender. You know, they're like a robot, like R2-D2. What gender does R2-D2 have? You, you see my point? So that's the kind of sexual identity that a schizoid has. If Hitler is a schizoid, that explains to you Hitler's sexual identity. So I was originally talking about like Hitler doing a devalue and discard of the German people. And, um, You know, th there's that kind of evidence that he might be a psychopath. So most people's discussion of Hitler as a psychopath in that context is like, oh, Hitler, oh, the Jews, oh, the camps, oh, psychopath. My discussion of Hitler as for his personality type doesn't even consider the Jews or the camps or anything. It simply looks at Hitler's interactions with people like Ava Braun. Why didn't they have children? Uh, Geli Ravel, why did she shoot herself in the heart with Hitler's pistol? One thing about Geli Rabul is that she was upset that she had the most, the most attractive man in Germany, at least by, by fame and, and, and popularity and social proof and everything. She had the man of Germany. Even Hitler was Time Magazine's man of the year in like 1931 or something. You know, Geli, Geli Rabul, his, his niece, she had the best man in Hitler, the most eligible bachelor in, uh, in Germany and yet he and he wanted her like as his girlfriend as his his uh his woman as his possession as his obsession and yet he didn't care for her at all for her emotions or her needs he was often in every way physically and emotionally absent from her she would just live in an, in a fancy apartment in like munich or somewhere or berlin perhaps and, um, you know, a, an apartment that he had secured for her. We've got something rattling back there. Got to try and stop it from rattling so much.
probably a futile. Got to throw it out. Um, yeah, she, you know, you know, she's like in like a bird in a golden cage. Like she's living the high life in a sense. She's got all this money paid for it to live in a fancy apartment. I think she might be living in Hitler's apartment or, or apartment that he funded for her, a very fancy apartment. And amongst all of this golden lifestyle, she's so unhappy amongst all of this outwardly seeming luckiness of her to be associated with Germany's most heroic uh, Chad, heroic alpha male. She's like, well, it's not real. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. He doesn't show, show me any affection. He doesn't pay me any attention. I just sit in this fancy apartment day after day, month after month, year after year, week after week, everything. And he doesn't even, he will stop by probably for 20 minutes now and then, and then he's gone for another month or something. Like, like her relationship with him was, was a sham, was a total sham. He was getting his needs met out of her, Geli Rabul, his niece, his romantic female. And he also had some cover there as well for, for not having sex with her because she's his niece. Like, oh yeah, Hitler's, Hitler's having a romance with his niece. It would be in the, in the tabloids type thing. But that gives him the perfect excuse not to touch her because she's his niece. So again, he strategically picked a woman that meets his needs as a schizoid. He knows that he doesn't want to have a connective relationship with the, the heart of the woman and the soul. He just needs basically a beard. He needs to have a female that can look like that he's somewhat suggestively romantically connected with this female so the public won't think that he's a homosex and, and lose, lose support from the public. But he doesn't want to have any kind of physical, romantic, connect, soul-to-soul -soul connection with any actual real-life woman, and he doesn't want to get a woman pregnant because he's a schizoid. And so he needs a woman that he can have by his side now and then be in public with, be seen and snapped with photographs with in the, in the papers, the magazines, the tabloids. Oh, it's Hitler with a beautiful woman. Oh, oh, oh. But he had no interest in a beautiful woman at all, other than how it would make him look in the press to the German masses. So the, the, the workers in the bakeries or the steel mills or whatever, the foundries in the Ruhr, everything like that, the farmers out on the farms with the hay bales and the, and the vegetables and the chickens and everything and the, and the pigs and the goats and the, the cows and the blah, blah, blah. 